Well, if ever there was a song to sing, <laughs> that would be the song, especially since this past week. Started out tragically, didn't it? 23rd of April with the loose van riding down the sidewalk, taking the lives of 10 individuals and maiming 16 others. Followed later on with the announcement of the birth of a royal, which is good news. And for us, followed by uh, the uh, announcement of a family member, a close family member, outside of our family, but a close friend's brother passing away on his 69th birthday and uh, having the privilege of going down and laying him to rest in the assurance of his eternal home that was prepared for him. And then, again, some good news, hopefully, in the world scene with North and South Korea getting together and, uh, and hopefully a step closer towards peace and unification within the Korean Peninsula. If ever there was a time to give us Jesus, <laughs> certainly been experiencing this week. So thank you very much, worship leader, for listening to the Spirit's leading and making that selection this morning. Masterful moments, masterful moments. I hope in your relationship with Jesus, uh, you've had some masterful moments with him. And most of those moments that people have had with Jesus while on earth usually ended up uh, happily. But if we look at our pa passage of scripture this morning in Mark chapter 10, we see that there's a little bit of a difference in scenario here in this, uh, and whether or not one could really call it a masterful moment. Um, but it, it is indeed uh, a moment with the master. And uh, I hope that as we look at it, we will see the importance of what it is. If you haven't caught on yet, you'll realize that these masterful moments deal with the choices we have to make in life. The important choice uh, is that it's the choice of coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ if we're not already there. And, and for us who are, um, making sure that we're connected that we remain faithful to him. Well, this tragic moment, you see, in all my years of ministry, I fear that there are many people attending our churches who are in the same condition as the young man that Robin read to us. And the actual passage of scripture goes to the end of that section, which is verse 31. So uh, if you haven't opened your Bibles to it, now's a good time to, and uh, just uh, kind of glimpse through from verses 23 on and see how uh, it concludes. But in all my years of ministry, I still feel that many people attending our churches who are in the same, con are in the same condition as this young man, they want to be saved. They may even feel they are saved, yet they have no understanding of what genuine biblical salvation is all about. And here in this passage of scripture this morning, Jesus tells us what it takes to be saved. Now, I don't know where you stand with the Lord. Some perhaps I do, others I don't. But I do know that if you are not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, in other words, if you are not a believer, you need to be. And the wonderful news today is that you can be. As we look at this passage of scripture in Mark chapter 10 this morning, I want us to consider three particular things. The first one is found in verse 17, and that's this man's desire, or all of mankind's desire. All three evangelists, Matthew, Luke, and Mark, tell us that this young man was rich. Matthew tells us in chapter 19, verse 22, that he was young. And Luke tells us 
in Luke chapter 18, verse 18, that he was a ruler or a leader, most likely a leader in the church. And when all the facts concerning this man are considered, it becomes clear that this young man had many things going for him in life. He had youth. Now Doug has youth. <laughs> so he says up here this morning. Youth is a wonderful thing, is it not? There is no better time to give one's life to the Lord, says the writer of Ecclesiastes 12 and 1. It says, keep your creator in mind while you are young. If you are young and unsaved, let me challenge you this morning to come to Jesus. Don't waste your life. Come to him now while he can use you for his glory and make something special out of your life. Now, that doesn't mean for us who are on in years are not used or cannot be used by God because we know as long as we open ourselves to his leading, we can be. But youth is the primary time to acknowledge who Jesus is and what he can do in our lives. The second thing this guy tells us in man's desire is that he had wealth. Verse 22 reminds us of that. The young man has plenty of this world's good. Now, there is nothing wrong with having money. Amen? Amen. <laughs> oh, you're a little cautious there. <laughs> Absolutely nothing wrong with having money. Scripture reminds us, however, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, it's the love of money that causes us all kinds of trouble. Some people want money so much that they've given up their faith and cost themselves a lot of pain thereafter. Youth, wealth, position. I know there's a lot of you this morning who would love to be up here where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I'd like to see you up here. <laughs> As I said a moment ago, Luke 18, 18, this probably means that he is a man of some influence in the religious circles. This man is living a clean, moral life. Notice that Jesus doesn't rebuke him when he claims to have kept the commandments that Jesus lists there. Outwardly, the man's life was clean and pure. And that's a wonderful thing. It ought to be true about every person in this room this morning. But from every outward appearance, this man was the ideal young pe person. He was everything a mother might want her son to be. Handsome. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Handsome. Religious. Industrious and moral. He was the envy of everyone he came in contact with. Yet, if we look within the pages here, in spite of all that he has going for him, this man had one big skeleton in the closet. He had found that his youth left him unsatisfied. It's, it's like it's right out of Ecclesiastes when Solomon talks about all the things he's experienced in life and yet he found it in vain. This man, young guy had everything going for him yet he had one big skeleton in the closet. He had found that his youth left him unsatisfied, his money had left him feeling unfulfilled, his morality, his clean living, his religious activity wasn't able to satisfy the deepest longings of his soul. His swift climb up the rungs of the social ladder had failed to give him what he wanted most, peace with God. And so he comes with haste, says he ran, it comes with haste to Jesus. He falls down before the Lord and he cries out to Christ. Maybe there are people 
in this room in the same shape as this young man. From every outward appearance, you have it made. Life has been good to you. You have a little bit of money in your pocket, just like I do, a dollar fifty. <laughs> Maybe you have climbed up the social ladder. Maybe you are a good person who has lived a clean and moral life. But in spite of all you have, there's still something missing. Everything looks good outwardly, but inside, you're all messed up. If that describes you, then listen, because Jesus has a word of hope for you today. Man's deception. The second part. It's seen in, in the confusion that this young man was going through as he comes to Jesus. But in coming to Jesus, we see that he does uh, three things right. Three things right. First of all, he comes to the right person. He had evidently heard of Jesus, and he knows that if anyone can help him from what he has heard, Jesus can. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He comes at the right time. He comes running because he knows the urgency of the situation. Nothing in life is as urgent as your salvation. Life could end at any moment. This past week has told us that. And you need to be sure that you are in relationship with Jesus Christ. James 4, verse 14, it reminds us, what do you know about tomorrow? How can you be sure about your life? He also came kneeling, which shows that he recognized in Jesus that he is worthy, that Jesus is worthy to be approached, but he is not. When you do come to Jesus, you will come as a broken person, much like the story of the prodigal. It won't be fun and games, but there will be an understanding that you are a sinner and he is indeed the Holy One. There will be a desire to become low before him. In 1 Peter 5, 6, we are reminded, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And of the, at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. The right person, the right way, the right time. He came when Jesus was nearby. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. He's the only one who cares and understands. At the right time, Jesus was nearby. You see, man doesn't come to the Lord whenever man wants to. He comes when Jesus is passing close to him. And that's why the Bible reminds us in Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. You never come to him when you want, because most of the time we don't want. <laughs> but we recognize when he is near, and that's the time we ought to be listening and responding. So while this man gets it right on several times, he gets the main thing terribly wrong. Notice his question in verse 17. Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And I think there's two basic problems with this question. First, he thinks salvation can be earned. And how many of us have thought that way at times? In other words, the young man is looking for a do oriented salvation. He wants to be involved. He wants to get his salvation like he has gotten everything else in life. He wants to earn it for himself. 
Many people still believe that salvation is based on doing. They have to do something to get it. Be it join a church, teach a Sunday school, belong to a band, senior or junior, worship, preach, and the list could go on. Yet the Bible tells us in no uncertain terms that salvation is never about do. Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it says, He saved us because of his mercy, not because of any good things we have done. So if your thinking has been around the lines that you will obtain salvation because you do all things right, you got to lose that thinking. We get salvation because of what Jesus Christ has done. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Salvation has never been about what we can do, but has always been about what he did. It's received by us when we accepted what he did by faith. For by faith are you saved through faith, that not, of, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So there was the confusion. Then there's the confrontation in verses 18 to 20. When Jesus hears what the young man wants, he responds in, in an unusual way. He confronts this young man in two aspects. He presents to him the person of the Savior. When the young man called Jesus good, Jesus reminded him that no one was good but God. This was designed to make the young man consider how he viewed Jesus Christ. Was Jesus just an elevated teacher, as the word good master implies? Or did this young man say that he believed Jesus to be God in the flesh? Obviously, in reading it, this man only believed that Jesus was a good teacher. But we know he is indeed God in flesh. He is the way, the truth, the life, according to John 14, 6. And so I ask you this morning, do you know who Jesus is? He is the only hope you have of salvation and a relationship that will grow into becoming more like him. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, it says, And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son God does not have life. So finding out who Jesus is is one of the primary steps in coming to know him. The second thing Jesus shares with him in his confrontation, is the problem of sin. Anybody have a problem with sin this morning? It is a problem. And when Jesus reminds this young man that only God is good, he's, he's trying to get this morally right young man to see that he still is a sinner. I remember in our first married appointment, we had an elderly lady a tall elderly lady, um, and I was taking her home one day and we got talking about the fact that we were all sinners and she adamantly said from the back seat, I am no sinner. And of course, me being a young officer and wanting to get a point across, I said, oh, but yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> and adamantly she said, no, Lieutenant, I am not a sinner. And then I saw the errors of my way. I was really causing strife in this dear soul's life. And I ended by saying, but we are all sinners saved by grace. 
and I think she settled with that one easily. Let's not kid ourselves. Jesus has to continually remind us that we are sinners in our relationship with him, if he is our Lord and Savior, we are sinners saved by grace. But we are still sinners. An alcoholic is an alcoholic <laughs> and will always be. He may be reformed, but he will always be an alcoholic. He'll tell you that. You see, and that's the heart of the problem. It's a problem of the heart. Man is a sinner. Romans 3, 10 and 12 says, no one is righteous, no one is truly wise, no one is seeking God, all have turned away, all have become useless, no one does good, not a single one. He can clean up the outside all he wants to, but he's still a sinner. You can... Wash a pig, perfume him, put a ribbon around his neck, and he looks good, he looks clean, but turn, turn him loose, and he'll head straight to the wallow. Why? He's a pig. <laughs> and that is what pigs do. A sinner may turn over a new leaf and look good outwardly. He may be a moral, clean, hardworking person, but he still is a sinner at heart who needs a Savior. We need Jesus. And so we sing, give me Jesus. And that is what Jesus wanted this young man to know, and that is what he wants you to know today as well. And then he brings clarification, that clerica moment. Jesus still loved this young man regardless of his sins and regardless of his improper understanding of the things of God. Now, isn't that beautiful? Jesus still loves us as we are. And he loves us so much that he wants to take us from where we are to where we can be with him. As proof of his love, Jesus tells this young man how to be saved. It is this message <coughs> that we all need to hear. And Jesus tells him to do three things. This is where the rubber meets the road for him and for you and I. Now, if I were in this man's shoes, this would be a hard one, I think. In our materialistic age, as it was back then perhaps, Jesus says to him right off, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. That's great for us as Salvation Army, isn't it? who work with the, the poor and try to get, you know, we do our best to, to implement programs to, to uh, assist with, with lessening poverty in, in our world, in our communities. Um, so that's, that's good news to hear. And, and by doing so, Jesus is placing his finger on the root of the man's problem. You see, he loved his money more than he wanted God in his life. And yet we are reminded in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, that wonderful verse, no one can serve two masters for you will love one uh, and not, you will hate one and love the other or you will be devoted to one and despise the other because you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Money's not wrong. It's when money controls us. It's the love of money. So he says, sell your goods and give them to the poor. Then he says an interesting thing, which he says to you and I. Take up the cross. In other words, your loves, your goals, your desires, your plans, everything you have must be given up if you want to come to Jesus. The modern church says, Come to Jesus on your terms and live as you please. 
But Jesus is saying, according to Matthew 16, 24, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Which is the third thing Jesus responds, saying, follow me. And this is the crux of the matter. The young man has been following power, prestige, position, possessions, and Jesus says to him in Isaiah 45, 22, I invite the whole world to turn to me and be saved. I alone am God. No others are real. So as we look at this passage of scripture, we see that the, the demands of the gospel are clear. You must forsake your sins through genuine repentance and embrace the Savior by faith. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you openly declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. If you think you can have Jesus on the one hand and hold to the world with the other, you are dead wrong. If that is what you have, then you don't have Jesus and you don't have salvation. You have nothing more than religion and you need to be saved. Man's desire, man's deception. Now we come to man's decision. A decision being made in verse 22. But this is the tragic moment. See, this is an area that we don't talk about much in the church, I think. How many stories have you heard about the rich young ruler? Because it ends tragically. He made an earthly decision. He chose his possessions over Jesus. He loved his money more than he wanted to be saved. Jesus, my friends, will allow you to make the same choice. It may not be money. It may be pleasure. It may be your family. It may be your independence. It can be a number of things. If you want it bad enough, he'll let you keep it. But ask yourself this question. It's recorded in Mark 8, 37. Is anything worth more than your soul? Nothing is. Nothing is. And he made an eternal decision because of the earthly decision. Now visualize this. We're into the future. One day this man's youth fades and is gone. He retires from his prestigious position down at the synagogue. Finally, age and disease overtake him, and even his vast wealth can, cannot prolong the inevitable, and he dies. And when he dies, he finds out that his religion and his moral lifestyle were not good enough. For when he dies, he finds himself in hell, lost forever because he had walked away from the only hope he had ever had, Jesus Christ. This man had everything but Jesus. Friends, do you have money? Do you love money? Do you have position? Do you love it? Do you have youth, beauty, health?
health, education, or anything else that you can name and put there, but still ask Jesus. You don't have to go another minute without him. Today is a time of masterful moments. Don't let this moment with him become a tragic moment. In my home core, I had a relative who continually struggled oh so close in making the decision with Jesus Christ. Oh, so close. All through my upbringing, I could see Sunday after Sunday the struggle he was going through. And in conversation with him, ever so close, but never making the decision, never following through, never wanting the encounter. And tragically, it still goes on. But one day, one day, as we will all experience, we may end up in a tragic moment because we neglect to recognize that Jesus is nearby. Today can be your masterful moment. If Christ is speaking to you and he is saying, Step out, my child. One thing you lack is me. But you don't have to any longer. You can come before me. I am here for you. Come meet with me. The worship team is going to lead us in this song. Jesus, draw me close. And as they do, in this moment, listen to the voice of Jesus, for he is near. And respond positively to him. And if that positive step means getting up from your seat and coming to this place of prayer, you do that. You do that. And then encounter.